Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. It's where I learned to fish. You know, I started fishing with her with a, a cane pole. And she and my father, I think, spent a fair amount of time actually fishing together. And I grew up in Appalachia, North Carolina. And I think she gave him that, if I remember correctly, she gave him that rod about the time that we were living in North Carolina. And I think he fished it up there. And, and the time that I started fishing when when I was here in Arkansas, he, he gave it to me and I just like that connection. And I think that's what drives me in making nets. Ethan Eigelhart bringing us back to his great grandmother's connection and fly fishing. This story and the announcement of the winner of the custom wet fly swing net build out today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thank you for stopping by the show. Quick reminder at the end, we'll be doing a listener shout out, quick little spotlight. So stay till the end to hear who uh, from our listeners here we're shouting out to. If you're new to the show, please click that subscribe button and you'll get updated when the next episode goes live. Ethan Eigelhart, our net guru, walks us into and behind the scenes of creating a custom wood landing net. We find out how the custom build-out bonus came to be, which burl he selected, and all the details on what a burl is and how to make it beautiful, and all the super meaty details on building a high-quality fishing net. You get the why behind one of the best out there. So without further ado, here is Ethan Eigelhart from stoneflynets.com. How's it going, Ethan? Good, good. How about with you? Really good, really good. I'm excited today because we are going to announce uh, a cool, a cool thing. We have a winner for the net build, the custom uh, build out bonus that we've been talking about and you've produced. And we're going to have a whole series in uh, in the blog post. It'll be really cool. We're going to have a kind of a step by step of some of the photos of the net build, and we're going to announce. I'm I'm going to keep people suspense for a little bit here. Uh, we do a little of that and hold off till maybe uh, you know maybe midway in this episode or towards the end. We'll, we'll give a shout out uh, to the winner, and uh, and I will say it is uh, it is a female, so that's amazing. I think that's really cool. Hopefully that didn't just turn off uh, all the males who are listening to this. But um, but so let me start this off, Ethan. Uh, um, what I want to dig into today is is kind of uh, like building a net, right? I mean, you that's what you do. You build these amazing nets, and uh, I want to get into that. But uh, first, we had you on a, a couple times. We when we started this net build out, we did a short snippet episode. But back in I think it was 198, so a while ago, we had you on and did a full length episode. So we're circling back. So since then, since 198, what's been new? That was about a, maybe a year or two ago. So probably the biggest thing is, is that the um, collaboration with Tom Morgan is up and running. And they have oh, nice. um, nets on their site for sale. And you can do a catch and release package through them. And that's finally come full circle and is up and running now. Nice. I also just completed uh, a show in, in Charleston, South Carolina, so there was some time uh, for that because it had been about two years since I had done any any trade shows. Um, so I went to Charleston and did seaweed for the first time in two years, and I'm recovering from that. <laughs> How was the trade show getting doing that one? It was good. It was uh, They had, I think, over 45,000 people that came through this year it was their highest attended show in its history uh i met some great people um unfortunately i picked up a custom bamboo rod um <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> there you go i left with a little lighter pockets than i went in <laughs> with <laughs> that's cool that's cool right on so and what remind me again the name of that that uh, show it's the southeastern wildlife expo in it uh is either the largest or second largest wildlife expo in the U.S. And it's really fun. They've got everything that deals with outdoors, hunting, fishing, um, outdoor wear, you name it, they've got it. Wow. Wow, that's cool. So this is a this is a full-on, like an outdoor, uh, not just fishing, but not just hunting, like everything. Everything. They've got uh, custom gun 
makers there. Mm. They've got knife makers there. They've, they had me there. They had a, a custom bamboo guy there. Uh, they've got clothing. They've got artwork, furniture, you wow. name it. If it, if it deals with the outdoors, you can find it. That's cool. I think I think this is one I might have to add to the. Uh, I got back into it again this year with some shows. Was at Denver, you know, which was cool and uh, and uh, and. But yeah, it's uh, it's kind of fun getting back, you know, getting the show thing going. I, I think I'm gonna have to check in. Maybe I'll keep in touch with you on that. And that's uh, that just happened. So we're like in April, right? So that was in or was that in March? That was in middle to late February. Oh, that was late February. Yeah, February. Yeah, gotcha. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Good. Okay, so there's a, a quick little update, and I'll uh, highlight, uh, uh, let's see, episode 161, we had Tom Morgan, Rod Smith with Joel and Matt, had them on on that episode, so I'll put the link to that in the show notes, really cool, obviously the Tom Morgan story keeps, his name keeps coming up so much, you know, and, uh, just because of the history and his influence on Rod manufacturing, um, but before we dig into it for you, it kind of reminds me again on your influence, right, you're, so you, I know you're a woodworker first, and then you got into the net building well, who is your influence on net building? Are you just so kind of badass with the wood that you could kind of build everything? Um, I don't necessarily have an influence on the net building. I, um, years ago when I was doing woodworking at, um, for somebody in, in Charleston, it encompassed circular stairs, furniture, cabinets. Uh, and then I did an intensive uh, furniture course in Vermont and did a couple of pieces and did one piece com- almost completely by hand with limited power tools and sort of got bit by that bug. And, mm. um, once I got married, I, I gave up that job and started a, a different job, um, started a different internet business for about 10 years and got tired of that and just realized that if I wasn't going to be a fly fishing guide, I could easily make nets just cause I had the background. Um, so it really was the net company was just solely my, my idea, even though there are tons of people out there. I didn't really have a connection with anybody on it. It was more of a, I had the background to do it. So I think that was probably, yeah, I think I would have preferred to go the route I would instead of trying to, change somebody else's inspiration and design to be my own, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I love that. I love you're kind of doing your own thing. And that's, that's kind of similarly the way we do it on this podcast. I tend to, you know, not listen to too many other podcasts because I like to kind of, you know, do our own thing and let it be organic and, and have our own style. So hopefully, you know, that's working out a little bit, but, uh, well, let's dig into, I want to talk on the net build here. Just if somebody's coming in and they want to know how the process works and we're going to lay out some, some photos and some information in the, in the show notes, uh, which will be essentially a blog post, but, but take us there. Let's walk through this kind of the step. So from square one, and I know, um, there's the wood, right? Maybe is that where you start when you get a new net? Let's say, let's say for this example, the wet fly swing net, swing net you created for the winter. How did how did we start that off? So the process for a custom build it generally starts off somebody emailing me, and some emails are short and sweet. I want a custom build. What are my options? And other emails are much more detailed. Like they they know what they want. They know the woods they want. And so depending on those two, usually it ends up with a phone call um, talking about the use for the net, where they're going to be fishing the net, um, the size of the net to make sure that they're getting what they need. Um, The longer the handle, the net, um, the two constraints really are um, price and you start getting out of certain woods just because i can't find that length um shorter handle stuff really if i can find it it, i can build i can make a net out of it um so for us we talked and we decided on the back country and in talking we sort of had whittled it down to i think maybe four or five wood species um, I think we had redwood lace, we had buckeye, we had the uh, a Chechen burl, um, 
there might have been a red molly pearl in there and something else I can't remember. And so I think you know, as we talked, we kind of whittled it down to that Chechen, one, because I don't do a ton of nets out of it, and two, you like the coloring and the grain and and yeah. and that stuff. And that's generally how it goes. So you kind of tell me what you're looking for in your handle. And some people want a lot of color. Some people want a lot of figure. It's really what appeals to you. And then I generally give you two or three options and we start whittling it down from, from there. And then once we have the handle, if it's a burl, I'll start taking it through the stabilization process and once it comes out of there and I get it rough shaped, we'll start talking hoop and what you want in the hoop. Some people want color. Some people don't want color. Some people want it matching. Some people want it more contrasting. And so you're slightly limited in hoop woods just because I don't steam bend. So I pay a little bit more attention to woods that are that are more willing to to be bent around a form without using steam um since i live in arkansas i don't need it to be any hotter and humid in my <laughs> my shop um but yeah. also it's really it's a time consuming really fast process that lends itself to two people and as a single it can be a little bit rushed so that's one reason i don't do it and two if i don't have to do it i don't want it yeah that makes sense. It's kind of my feeling. Yep. Yep. So if somebody's doing and is this net thing too, you know, it built the building of, of the net. Is this something that somebody could actually do on their own? It sounds like there's some things that are a little bit tricky here. Uh, could they, could they pick up a, a YouTube video and build a net or what's that look like? Yeah. So if you have some basic experience and basic tools, you can build a net there the the small little hurdles that you have to overcome throughout the process um such as having the right tools to rip the strips and then to get them down to thickness now if you're going to steam bend you've got more wiggle room um and then you just have to have the tools to be able to to shape the handle probably the biggest hurdle is making the form to bend the hoop just because that that can be re, that's really time consuming to get it symmetrical and right, but it's I don't want to say it's easy, but it, there I've definitely done harder things in woodworking. I think the the real limitation in net building is just having all of the tools, whether it's a table saw, band saw, some way to sand the strips down clean. Um, a way to cut out the handle, a way to shape the handle. You know, there's sort of all these little tools that a lot of people don't have, but there are a ton of people who do build, build a net and give it to dad or give it to sister or whoever. Yep. That's cool. No, I think it's, uh, yeah, the, the bending, the custom bending of the wood seems like one of those, uh, skills, you know, challenges, right. Of, of, I remember, Back in when I was a kid, we had my uncle actually had his woodworking shop. It's funny, I hadn't really thought about this, but his woodworking shop in our garage back when I was a kid. And I remember he made all sorts of things. He was making um, custom uh, fly boxes for my dad back in the day, but he also was making this piano. And there's all sorts of curved curvature in it. And it was, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if you ever finished that project, <laughs> but again, I just, I, I just saw it. It was like, wow, there was a lot to it, right? All the wood, the bending and the, the fine, I mean, the, the net obviously isn't quite that detailed, but just the bending of the wood sounds like that's kind of a hurdle. It can be a hurdle if you get the radius too small, it's really easy to crack them. So you have to, oh. the, the radius of the hoop that at some point the radius will become too small and you'll be forced to steam bend it. So you have to, so my smaller nets are kind of right on that edge, but if you're doing a big net, it's, you don't have to worry about it as much. The, the tedious part is getting the radius 
and keeping it symmetrical because it doesn't take a lot to change the look of the net, you know, a, a 32nd or a 16th out of symmetry, you know, kind of gets the net all cocked out. All right. So that's where you have the, the, the template or the form or whatever, where you just wrap it around this thing and then secure it in, in the, what do you call it in the form? I call it a form. Some people, um, I'm, it, the word is eluding me. I call it a form. Yeah. Yeah. Template. Cause or that's whatever. really, yeah. Template, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but I call it a form because that's kind of what, what it is because I'm reusing it and it's, um, and I've got pieces that go to it that are specific. So each one of my nets has their own form. So I, I've got five or six forms at this point, maybe even more, that I can make nets yeah. from at any given time. So if you're going to do one net, you might as well plan on doing a couple because the amount of time you'll put into that first net, you know, you might as well go ahead and make two or three and at least get your time back. <laughs> right, right. That's it. Yeah. So, so it's the batching, the batching like I should do with these podcasts, more, more of the batching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what are they, so steps wise, just take a bit, again, big picture. If you had to say, are there kind of 10, eight steps, you know, what, how many steps if you had to narrow that down to say, okay, it's eight steps to build a custom net or how, what would you say? How many steps are there? Well, let's count them. So you've got from the very beginning, you've got cutting out the block for the handle. So if you've, unless, unless you've bought the block pre-cut for me, like that Chechen burl we used, I had to slice up the burl to make the blocks. And then out of each one of those blocks, I cut another block for the handle. So that process there can be three or four steps, but we'll just say you have a, a block that you bought from your local woodcraft or um, your local woodworking store. So that process is done. So, step after that would be to put it into an oven and dry it if it's a burl. If it's not a burl, you can skip that. And what is a burl? Remind us again what, what the burl is, how that's different from just the normal wood. So a burl is at some point, it can be underground or on the tree. And we'll just go with the on, on the tree example, is where at some point in the tree's life, there was damage to it, whether a, a branch broke off or a squirrel or a woodpecker dug a hole in it and it gets an infection and the tree then grows around the infection. And what you, and what you see is like a tree that has a big bulb on it. Like, like, like there's a round section, that's a burl. And so there's some infection that's gone in there that the tree has then grown around and continued to grow. And as the tree grows, the burl grows. Oh, wow. So it's kind of the trees essentially trying to heal itself. And then within that burl, like on ours, there's these cool little like blue. We, we made it right. We wanted blue for the, for the wet fly swing colors logos. And that blue is pretty, really pretty cool and pretty unique. Well, the blue that's in the net is not natural to the wood. Oh, OK. So explain that. So you, you added that to talk about that a little bit, how that works. So once the burl is is in the this is many steps down the road. So let's skip to that. Yeah, we'll circle back around. So we'll circle back around to the fill because that gets answered down the road. Okay. Yeah, let's circle around. So so keep us on. I, I'm getting you yeah. sidetracked. So keep us on track on our steps. So one of the cool things that you'll see is that if you get a burl from underneath the ground, it's horrible if you're cutting it up. But there are times when I'll get a burl that's been underground and I'll cut it and there'll be old nails in it or there'll be rocks and there's mud. And, and so it, it'll start encompassing and growing around things that are in the soil. And I've picked out old nails, old square headed nails out of burls, um, ruins a $75 or a $200 bandsaw blade, but you'll get those artifacts sometimes in underground burls. But, Ours was most likely above ground from what I can tell because there's no dirt, no stone in it. So I slice that up. It goes into an oven and cooks for at least 24 hours because I'm removing as much moisture from it. Even if it's kiln dried, it still has moisture in it. 
And so you want to get out. In theory, you want all of the moisture out. Um, but that can be a really long, drawn out process. Right. And is this your is this your kitchen oven or is this another type of oven? I do not recommend using your kitchen oven because it will not be the same afterwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no um, kitchen oven. Okay. No kitchen oven. I've got a really large toaster oven in my my shop. And so I find after about 24 hours for my use, most of the moisture is gone. Um, if you're really going to do it, you would put it in for 20, you would weigh it, get a weight on it, put it in the oven for 24 hours, pull it out, put it on the scale, reweigh it, put it back in for like six hours, reweigh it. And you keep doing that until the weight doesn't change. And then that tells you the moisture is all out. Um, I just go 24 hours. It works for me. Um, from there, it goes into an acrylic solution where I pull all of the air out of the wood. Um, and that can take anywhere from 12 to 24 hours um, to get all of the air out. Then once all the air is out, I release the pressure and it sucks up that acrylic solution and then stays in there for a set period of time, comes out and goes into the oven. So like just to stabilize the blank, you're at what, five or six steps. Okay. Um, gotcha. And then from there, plane it flat plane, and then sand it to thickness and take and put, put my template on it, mark it out, cut it on a bandsaw. And then I go to the spindle sander and start hand shaping it to, to smooth out all the edges and make it ready to get glued up. Um, and I do the sanding because the sanding creates little ridges, which gives you a better um, adhesion with the glue and the sanding strips. Because then the glue gets penetrated into the wood a little bit, and each one of those ridges kind of melds with the ridges on the on the hoop. Um, so just to shape the handle, you've you've got three or four steps. Um, the worst part is probably doing the the laminate strips because I get those they're pre plane for me. So I don't have to clean them up and plane them, but you sit there and you just got to rip a bunch of you know, each net takes five strips or, or however many strips you want to do. The fewer strips you do, the more likely you're going to have to steam bend. The more strips you do, the thinner you can make them and less likely you have to steam bend them. Gotcha. So this is where you're taking the strips and you're putting them together five or so strips, and then that makes your hoop, essentially, and you're bending it around your, your form. Yeah. It's probably the process leading up to the making of the net that has so many steps and takes so long and is probably the biggest limiting factor in somebody really making their own net is that there are just a ton of steps to do to get to the beginning of the build process. So, like, ripping strips for me is almost a whole day process, because I'm ripping for six or seven or eight nets. But even if you even if you weren't, it's still a long process because you still have to get them down to your thickness um, once you're done. So you have to sand them to get them down to thickness. But once you have all of the parts, it's a relatively fast process. Once I have all the strips and I have the handle done, it goes in the form, it gets glued up. And then from the, from there, it's just starting to shape it. So I trim the, the ears off like you saw and just start shaping the, the handle to get it so the hoop and the handle all come together nicely. Um, on yours, I did a little bit more hand work. So I, I hand planed most of it down to finish thickness and then just passed it through the sander at 220 to get it kind of smoothed out and in between that process once it comes out of the form and you kind of get it rough cleaned up you i go back in and they're natural not inclusions in in most burls not all burls um and those are just little holes that are in the burl and so i'll clean those out and generally what I do is because they're naturally there, 
I, that's when we had the conversation about what do we want to fill it with? Yeah. Right. And that's where that, that blue came in. Cause that's, um, a New Mexico turquoise. And, oh, right. and so then I fill all of those little knot holes with crushed stone and I can do pr- really pretty much if much anything, my main ones are turquoise, malachite, azurite, lapaluzzi. Those are kind of the four major fills I do. Um, and those are, or I guess you would call them semi-precious stones. Mm-hmm. Um, the Azerite is probably the most expensive out of all four of those. And that's probably the most precious out of all four of those, but it's a really nice dark, bright blue. And in some things it really, really yeah. pops. Um, yeah. but we went with the turquoise cause it, it, it slightly matched, um, or did match the, your, your colors, yeah, but it also turquoise just really looks good on most woods. It just has a nice. It's not overly yeah. overly bright. No, it's that blue. It's that I love turquoise, and that's our color. I when we first went with our logo, the color it just you know what I mean. It just stood out to me like yeah. oh, it kind of, it's kind of water right, but it's also just unique. And also for me, again back to my grandma. I was going to ask you this question about your grandma, but my grandma, my dad's mom had all these amazing turquoise, all those blue rings, right? She had all this jewelry. I always loved it because she always had like tons of rings and necklaces and it had that same blue. And until this moment, I actually totally forgot that that was actually a connection. Um, but tell us about your connection because you had a, I want to, let's take a quick break because I don't want to miss this one as we, um, as we move through here. Uh, we're going to finish up on the rest of the build, but, but take me really quickly to your, your grandma, that story. Can you give us a little highlight on that or would you like to leave that till the end? Um, so the highlight on my grandmother, it was actually my great grandmother. And as a child, I spent a lot of time with her and, and it's where I learned to fish. You know, I started fishing with her with a, a cane pole and she and my father, I think spent a fair amount of time actually fishing together. And I grew up in Appalachia, North Carolina. And I think she gave him that, if I remember correctly, she gave him that rod about the time that we were living in North Carolina. And I think he fished it up there. And and the time that I started fishing when, when I was here in Arkansas, he, he gave it to me and I just liked that connection. And I think that's what drives me in making nets is that I want you to be able to pass along something that has sentimental value to you, to somebody that you love, whether it's a son, a daughter, whoever. And I think that, I think those connections are important in this day and age to have things to remember loved ones by. And that's what I strive for in making my nets is making something that's going to be like that. And I really formed my business model around that three weight bamboo rod don't all don't fish it all the time because it's a total noodle but the memories that are there are what drive this business yeah that's great i love that story and that's something i've tried to share i'm glad you kind of clarified that a little bit so that was a bamboo rod an old bamboo rod and you still um you still have that that rod i still have that rod and i still fish that rod and probably not the smartest move but it's what i learned to fly fish on um (laughs) you know if you really (laughs) want to talk about beating your head against the wall take a three-weight bamboo out and lawn cast it and try and figure out how to cast (laughs) there you go well it's interesting because you brought the full circle again this is so cool because you know tom morgan rod smiths you know i mean obviously they build a bunch of different rods but there is some bamboo in there, right? Or there was a mix, especially with Tom Morgan in the history. I can't remember if he started in bamboo and, and moved over, however that worked. We'll have to fact check me on that one. But right, the bamboo is an amazing connection because it's this history. That, that's probably why the bamboo is so cool, right? Yeah, I think it, it's back, to, at least for me, I think bamboo is just a connection back to you know family that I remember. I think if I didn't have family that fished bamboo, I don't necessarily know that I would totally care, but it is for me, it's going back to simpler times in essence, I guess that Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily a purist when it comes to fly fishing. Um, but it's just, I like, 
I, one, I'm a history nut, so I really am in, into history. But there's just something really neat about fishing something that's, you know, at least my age or maybe even a little older than I am. I mean, this, this, this three weight I have is at least 50 years old or, oh, wow. or pretty close to 50 years old. So it's kind of neat to fish something that that's that old that I don't necessarily know. I think fiberglass is probably getting into that realm now. Yeah, that's right. Is there a, uh, just curious on it. Is there like a name or a, is it just kind of a, a rod that's just kind of unmarked? No, it's an Orvis, um, Oh, cool. It's Orvis. Yeah. Yeah. It's an Orvis. I think it's in Madison, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So it's an old Orvis bamboo. That's probably a pretty, it's so it, is it in pretty good shape? It's in great shape. Oh, wow. Yeah. You got a cool rod. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's nice that it's an Orvis, but again, I just, you know, it's more important to me the the family connection and, um, but I think you know, we haven't gotten to the point to where graphite is 50 years old and people are no fishing not quite but there are some we did a, a history episode a couple I, i'll put a link in the show notes to this and we talked a little bit about kind of vintage you know the different types of thing and and man i mean i have an old lama glass rod that's from the 80s that was a steelhead rod like an eight weight and i'll tell you what that thing is classic right yeah because it's you don't find them like that it's a noodle it's a kind of a noodle almost like a bamboo rod but i i love the rod and it's and it's old school so i think we're getting there i mean that shows the age a little bit right because now we're <laughs> when you talk about stuff in the 80s obviously you know we're talking 40 50 years ago but um i mean that's that's legit right i mean they, we are getting to that point i mean some of us yeah um but i also think that you we're, we're getting to point and i think um you it was touched on in one of your podcasts that there's very few items in fly fishing. And I think in a lot of things, you you, you probably take it over to hunting too, where you're meant to buy one item and use it for a long time. Like we've become such a really close to a disposable society. And and, um, and I think fly rods are that kind of, I mean, I just, I don't picture um, like an Orvis recon because you know they just make so many of them i just don't ever see that becoming like a collector's item as you do some of the like older fiberglass rods or even some of the newer you know just not a ton of people are doing fiberglass so i think it's um and that and i try and stay on that side of the spectrum like yeah that's where you are I think that's where you are, Ethan. I mean, you got the the custom is what's still there, even though there's a bazillion types of rod styles for each company. You're still the custom, right? There's custom fly rods, custom nets, custom whatever, and you can still find that. Yeah, but even with, on my side, there there are people who make don't get me wrong, great nets at lower price points. But you know, in my opinion, I think those are are getting they're they're cranking out a bunch of those in the same same wood, same style, same look. Yep. But because they're so cheap, you're kind of meant to say, Oh, I got five years out of it. I'll go spend another $125. All right. Um, and, and I just, when I started this business, I was kind of like, okay, that's kind of what I'm going to do. And I really pivoted quickly. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. Like that wasn't, yep. I want you to buy one net for me, and then if you need a, a second net, it's because you want something bigger or you want something smaller, yeah. not because this fell apart after five years. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd rather you call me in five years and say, hey, I'd like a little refresh on it. Send it back to me, and I'll refresh it for you. Um, but you're not sending it back in five years because it's fallen apart. You've, you're sending it back because you've used it a whole bunch and you just want a fresh coat to finish on it. Yeah. Love that. That's it. So this is a lifetime. This is a, like the net that I have, you know, and you built this net for the winter. So we might as well, I, I said we might do it midway. So let's, yeah. <laughs> let's take a break and announce the winner really quick because, um, this has been pretty cool. We got this out there and, uh, and just, uh, you know, drum roll, please. <laughs> And the winner is for the custom build out bonus. Julie Kellner. 
Julie Kellner won the net, and she, um, I believe, is in the Northwest. I think she might be. Well, maybe you, you've already, right, the net's already out to her. If she's listening now, she should have the net in her hand, right? Yes, she should. Um, and I believe she is in Washington. Yeah, I think but so. But I think yeah. she is in Pacific, Pacific Northwest, so she'll get some really good use out of it there. Perfect. Um, and I think it's it's cool that it went to a female. Sorry to all the males, but yep. I think I think our sport is a little little lacking in the female side. So I'm glad that it went to a female. Me too. Me too. I love it because when you look at the the demographics, you know, of people listening to this show, it's definitely heavily weighted on the male, right? Yeah. But, but we do have some females and they're, you know, out there. And so I, I agree. I think this is the perfect deal. And Julie is so stoked and excited. You know what I mean? When I told her about this, that she won. And so I think this is just an amazing thing. Um, so we'll put a, a link, um, out to again like i said some, some photos of that net and w- let's finish off the photo like the way we talked because there's some more to this net you you actually did some like a you have a professional like calligrapher right that did the the writing talk about that little piece because that's a nice little finishing touch the calligrapher i have to totally 100 percent credit matt over at tom morgan oh cool um i was signing them by hand up until maybe s- six months a year ago ish. Um, and they, for their net, they said, Hey, we'd like to have our name calligraphy on it. Um, how can we go about doing this? And so I said, well, it doesn't make sense for me to send it to you to have your person do it, to send it back. Let me see if I could find somebody here. Let me tell you, it's really hard to find a calligrapher that's willing to (laughs) (laughs) work on something that isn't paper. Um, right. but I found a, a, a woman here in Little Rock that does it and I just really liked the look of it. And now I just send all of my nets to her, her, her calligraphy just really adds a really nice touch to it that my chicken scratch never yep. did. That's right. You would be both. You'd be yeah. The, yeah, the chicken scratch. It's it's tough. It's tough to write on. Uh, it's tough to write nice in general, but writing on a rod or something small like that is almost impossible. Yeah, I had to coax her into it a little bit, but she does just an absolutely um, wonderful job on doing it. And um, it takes her about a week because she, she says she has to be in the right frame of mind, and I totally get that, but. It just really adds a nice touch. Like it just yep. after seeing it on there, I was like, not doing anything different. That's it. Yeah. Um, and that was probably the last piece in my net building process that I was never happy with. Like I just and it never dawned on me to to take it to a calligrapher. Like that was not like I was trying to think of of other ways to do it. And um Yeah. But that was the last piece. Like, don't you know? I'm proud of all the nets I've built, but as a perfectionist, that was sort of the last. It's custom. Yeah, the last piece that always I never was quite happy with. Like, uh, yeah, uh, that's not it. And then I found her, and that was it. And I, I'm really happy. That's cool. And even down to the custom, because you do the, I didn't even realize this either, but what's the end, the little brass, um, where you clip on your, your net, the, what's that piece called? I call it a brass eyelet. Eyelet. Yeah. And, and you actually create that, right? You actually build that, that eyelet. Yeah. I struggled for a long time. I was using stainless steel and I just wasn't happy with it. It just didn't look right. And all of the brass eyelets that were out there just i didn't like the looks like it's really hard to find those kinds of things on the internet whether i'm not searching it right who knows um but i went to a friend of mine who is a machinist and said hey this is what i want can you do it and he said well let me try and he came back and said well i can do it but it's not going to be cheap i'd rather teach you to do it and sell you my little mini lathe over there and just have you do it. And I was like, okay. Oh, cool. Wow. Um, so I'm not a machinist in any way, but I can, this is the one thing on a metal lathe I can turn. It's a multi-step process that takes a long time. Cause it's metal. Like I was surprised at how 
it probably takes me 45 minutes to do one from beginning to end. But I buy brass um, solid tube in four foot sections and just start cutting them up and hand turn it on, on the lathe. And it just, it gives me the look that I want. Yep. Yeah, it looks cool. And I think you find this in really anything that's custom built that people will, a lot of custom makers do most all of the steps themselves because they just can't find what they want. So we make what we want. Awesome. Love that. So that's another finishing touch. You got the, um, you know, you got the, the calligrapher and then also the net, right? The, the net is kind of, we haven't talked about that. Describe those nets because everybody kind of seems like everybody knows, right? The net is this nice, easy, fish-friendly plastic. Uh, well, I don't even know if it's plastic, but but I guess, is it silicone? Or what, what is the net? It's um, a PVC, I think it's PVC vinyl rubber, um, some combo of that um that's the one piece that is mass produced and i i buy it from whoever i can really at this point it's whoever has it right um there i don't have one specific supplier for that so basically it sounds like your net is you know right now you're just kind of getting that net and obviously it's a, it's a fish friendly net but uh, you're getting it from Weber you're not you're not custom making the net or anything like that but it's in part of it because you're doing such small batches you can't right you can't just go out they they want you to buy a bunch of those nets sort of thing right they want you to buy a bunch of them but it's probably the one item on 99% of the nets that we all are buying from somebody cuz it's just cost prohibitive to really just have them made for me. Like it would be really nice to have a custom bag for me that was like made in the U S they're just, you know, I've looked into it and it's just, it's not doable, which is too bad. That's the one key that I wish, wish I could change, but it's the one hurdle that for most net makers we're not overcoming at this point, unless we probably all banded together and, you know, did it ourselves, but, um, the bags are high quality. And if I would have them made for myself, they would double or triple in price. And I don't think people would be willing to pay that much more for a bag. And the cool thing about the bag is that literally, I mean, it is a bag and the net you can, I mean, you can take off the bag down the line, right, and put a new bag on if you want or if something you want to change it up. Or I, I guess the bags eventually maybe get old and start to crack too, right? Um, I'm on on my test nets. I'm going on five years, and the bags are still holding up. But at some point, you'll want to replace them. I sell net bags. Um, probably the biggest hurdle to overcome is you're kind of – stuck with my net bag design you don't have to buy it for me but the holes are laid out for my bag so if somebody doesn't have the tabs that my bag has their whole lineup may not work and so then you have to decide whether you want to drill more holes in your net or stick with that bag design mine is probably the most common bag design um, but yeah. there are some people who use a slightly different bag and they have a different hole pattern. Um, so if you buy a replacement bag from me, you'll be able to use the same holes. If you go with somebody else, um, if they have the tabs, it'll most likely work. If they don't have the tabs, you're going to be stuck drilling more holes. That's it. Well, and, that, and it sounds like that's not a, really a concern is that once they have them, for the most part, it's going to last for a long time the nets. Um, and, and then, and then just talk before we start to, we're going to take it out of here pretty quick, but on the wood, you mentioned a little bit about the wood as far as where it came, you know, where you get the wood, are you getting this wood from all over the country? I know you've mentioned this before on the previous podcast, but describe that. And, and specifically for Julie's uh, net here, where did that burl come from? So the Chechen burl comes out of kind of Southern New Mexico, down through sort of Central America, and then a small sliver of South America is generally where that burl comes from. Um, 
I haven't sourced this one all the way back. I can source it all the way back if I, if I wanted to. I do try and get my wood from trace ethically sourced wood sellers so they can trace it back pretty far in the chain. So that's kind of where that comes from. I bought this um, from somebody, I believe they're in California. But I get most of my wood from all over. Like I get some wood from private landowners that I have connections with. I get wood out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, kind of depending on what I'm looking for will will steer me toward people I buy from. I've got maybe five or six main people that I generally buy from. Okay. And does ethically source kind of mean essentially they're like not chopping down live trees sort of thing? Or what's that, what's that revolve around? So it really comes from probably the late eighties to maybe mid nineties when there was just a huge, at least from my experience, a huge influx of illegally cut mahogany trees. And so that really sort of drove this push to be able to say we want it's kind of probably the equivalent of like blood diamonds yeah is that you don't want a tree that's been illegally cut no um and so there's certain woods like um koa is a really good example hawaiian koa you can only cut that if the tree is dying or there's a reason cut it. you can't cut a live one down you have to cut one that's either dead or really close to dead. Uh, and that only comes from Hawaii. So that's in you know, the market will be flooded with it for a little while and then it'll go away because there are no trees, but really it's basically being able to try and trace it back all the way down to the guy who cut the tree. So, you know, who cut it and the process it took. Um, and that's just to keep illegal trees out of the market. And for the most part, most people are going that way. But for me, my understanding of it, it all stems from mahogany. Mahogany. That's that's interesting. Okay. So, well, there's obviously, there's always things we're leaving on the table uh, on yep. this. But give us, a, we're going to hopefully have this blog post that we build here as associated with the link in the show notes that's going to walk, uh, you know, more detail on, on building this process on the build out. But where would you send somebody, you know, if, if they want to learn more? Like if you were just getting started today you knew nothing about how to build a wood net. Uh, where would you go or where would you send somebody? I, w- my advice would be just to Google um, building a wood net. It, you're probably going to end up with a lot of, you'll end up with more stories than videos, but I would bounce between the two and find the one that you like the best. Um, for the most part, they're all, decent i you know they're not necessarily ways i would do it but there's nothing wrong with the way they're doing them um and that's probably the best way you can always reach out to me i am going to be a little bit more proprietary in some of the things i'm willing to share with you than you will maybe if you see it on you know, if it's on youtube somebody is sharing the full thing um my finish i've put a lot of time into it um I'm not going to share the recipe. <laughs> no, that's good. I, we don't want to, yeah, we're not going to give the secret. So I, I did search that building a net and there definitely is. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a website literally, I don't know, you know, it's like all about fly fishing nets, but then I looked somebody I do yeah. know is like global fly fisher who we had on the podcast. He's got a DIY wooden landing net, um, you know, do it yourself sort of thing. So yeah. yeah. Well, we'll put a link out to that as well. And I'm sure if I searched YouTube, I would probably find some similar, um, decent videos. You would, and my only piece of advice is that most net builders are wi- willing to share advice. Don't email us and say, how do you build a net? Yeah. You're not going to get a response. <laughs> no. You mean like, like don't, don't expect somebody's going to walk you through the steps, like, like we'll, kind of what we did today a little bit. Yeah. Um, but if you are, most people are really willing to help if you have a specific, um, but but if you email somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. This is what I've done. Do you have any recommendations? You're going to get a better response than if you just say, how do you glue the handle to the hoop? Um, right. 
yeah, if you say, hey, look, I'm having trouble with adhesion or I keep getting breakage, do you have any suggestions? It's much more easier for us to respond to that than somebody who is just kind of maybe fishing. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah totally. I, and I get a ton of email there like, how do I build a net? And I'm just like, no. All oh, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do I build that? Yeah, like you're the. Yeah, you don't necessarily. You're not the. Uh, you don't have a training a course out there, right? You're not selling right. a course to build a net. You're not a teacher on that end, really. But I have people who are like, "Hey, I'm finishing a net, and I'm getting runs. Do you have any suggestions?" And to me, that's somebody who is obviously trying to figure out how to fix a problem. They're describing their problem, and so I'm much more willing to sit down and engage with them because I feel like they're working the problem instead of just asking me to solve the problem. Yeah, to solve it. Yeah, no, and that's part of the the custom, right, building anything, right, a fly rod or anything. That's the fun part of it. Yeah, and so now my problem solving is looking at the grain, reading it, making sure that when I hand plane it, I'm not chipping it out, and I like that. I've solved all the other little problems. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And I'm just looking. I had uh, we had fiberglass manifesto. Um, I'll put a link to this one as well. We had Cameron on a while back on the podcast. He did a little how to build a landing net sort of thing as well. So it looks like there's there's plenty of content out there. Um, yeah. But uh, good. Well, Ethan, I think we're I think we're looking good here. Um, so we got Julie. Uh, obviously, we mentioned that as the winner, Julie Kellner. And um, yeah, from here on out, what, what, what's it look like for you the next six months or so? Um, anything new you want to give a shout out to before we let you go here? I'm going to be going fishing soon, so I'm going on vacation. Hopefully, as soon as runoff is over in Colorado, that's what nice. I'm looking forward to. <laughs> nice. So when you go on vacation, tell me this. So when you go on vacation, are you able to shut everything off on kind of the business end? For the most part, where I go fishing in Colorado has very limited cell service, um, and it it's sort of I have to drive into town to check email or do a social media post. So for the most part, I would say I'm 95% disconnected. I do respond to emails that sound like they need to be responded to, but generally you're going to, I don't do an out of office reply. I'll you know send you a quick email that just says I'm on vacation, but I plastered yeah. on my website that I'm not in the office. <laughs> yeah. People know people. Yeah. That's, yeah, uh, that's good. No, you got to have that break. I think that's that's good for you and probably good for the business, right? To take a step back occasionally. Most definitely. So this I'm coming off of. So I'm fishing up the last batch of custom orders now. I'll be done with them in the next day or two. I've got one more batch of retail nets that I'm going to do, and then I've blocked off about a month just to regroup and to. Um, try some new things. I have found that if I don't block off time, then I can't ever try new, new things in net building. And there's some ideas I have that I want to try. So I'm going to have a little, a little design time in there too. Um, yeah. and hopefully maybe around Christmas, some of those ideas will, will be up on the website. Perfect. All right. Well, this has been a fun one again. Um, I think uh, we'll send everybody out to stoneflynets.com. Uh, and uh, definitely, this has been good, Ethan. I appreciate you uh, shedding a little bit of light on the uh, process. And, and thanks for doing this this giveaway. This has been, you know, obviously we have one winner, but I think just the process of seeing it out there and, and people understanding is what I was going for here. And, and I think we succeeded there. So yeah, until we talk again, good to uh, chat with you. Good talking with you too. And I uh, appreciate... Uh you doing the giveaway with me it was great fun so there you go if you want to check out the links check out the notes and check out everything we have going the show notes wetflyswing.com slash 318 318 will get you a super uh, awesome blog post this is going to be one that we are going to be uh, amping up so it's going to be a step-by-step -step, hopefully to what we talked about uh, today and you can kind of get a bunch of those photos take a look at the uh the winner hopefully we have a photo of uh, our winner there now that we've announced it you know who that is uh so we'll have a picture of the net and all the goodness quick listener spotlight before we get out of here ronald burnett ronald connected on instagram a while back and let me know that he 
Roy Love, the Landon uh, Mayor episode. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes to that one as well. Landon came back for a second time, and I think he was talking about the second one. But uh, Ronald, I just want to say thanks for listening to the show and appreciate you and the support. And it was great to uh, connect with you. If you want to connect with me, uh, Instagram, Wetfly Swing, or Wetfly Swing, wherever you want, send me a message. I would love to hear from you. If we haven't connected yet, this is the chance. Uh, definitely take a minute right now after this episode and shoot me a, a, a message or an email. You can check out the giveaways we have going right now, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway, and that's going to direct you into our biggest giveaway that's ongoing right now. And if we don't have one going, um, I would be surprised. But if we don't, it's still going to direct you over to uh, some good resources there. So check it out. I am going to get out of here really quick because it is getting late again, late into the night. So I'm going to get out of here and hope you have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. See you on the river or see you online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.